such a privilege to spend time with you on this very last day of 2023, and what a year it's been. Um, I believe for all of us, uh, the answer to that question is probably slightly different, um, but we're, we're continuing with um, a series today. It's an eight-week series that this campus is busy with about exiting seasons and entering seasons, and so today I've got the, the, the privilege of of uh, addressing the last exit discussion, which is appropriate for kind of just the way that we end the year and the way that we start and step into this new year. And really the, the theme of today is hope. You know, we spend some time reflecting on reflection and gratitude and the things that we should consider when we look back on a previous season. We need to end our seasons well so that we can start our new seasons without baggage. But kind of just before we take the step into 2024, it's worthwhile to consider our posture, isn't it? Because your previous season has the capability of affecting the posture with which you approach the new season. If your previous season was incredibly challenging, your identity might have taken a little bit of knocks. Your value might have taken a little bit of knocks. Your self-assurance might have taken some knocks. And so you're not really confident in the way that you approach the new season because the previous season told you things that have affected the way that you look into the future. Isn't that so? And so the question is, is that really the, the posture with which we want to approach a new season? And is there something else perhaps that can change the way that we approach every new season in our lives. And I think today is such an important day to, to make that choice, to say, hey, how do I want to approach the new year? And yes, I know we all have this kind of idea, make the new year's resolutions, next year's going to be different. But so much of that sometimes comes from the failures and the trauma of the year before, isn't it? Because your new year's resolutions are necessarily things that you want to change, isn't it? And so all of that is kind of a knee-jerk reaction to the stuff that you feel didn't go well in the previous season. And by doing that, we allow the season we're coming from to actually define the objectives and the narratives of the season we're stepping into. And it becomes kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's really a strange kind of way to just approach this. And so the question is, is there a different way? Is there a different approach we could follow? And so that's what today is really about. I would like you guys to have a look at a short video, because what plays out in this video about this little girl who's about to step into a new space gives us such a lot of tools and handles just around how we need to process through the change in season. Are you guys ready? Can you put it up for me? Do I need to take a Isn't that just so precious? So the reason I really love this video is because in this little girl, you see the untethered emotion of stepping into a new season, right? And as adults, we've learned to kind of temper our emotions. So all of this stuff is still happening on the inside. It's just not expressing. Are you with me? You feel exactly the same way, don't you? Right? And so as adults, we, we, kind, of, we kind of suppress a lot of these emotions, but She's going through this really kind of argument with herself. And then she's like, okay, yes, I'm ready. Okay, wait, no, I'm not ready. But the beautiful thing about this entire story is the fact that she ultimately, she makes the jump. She transitions into a new season. And the question that I've kind of was confronted with when I looked at this video, how many of you have seen those videos about dogs barking at each other through a gate? And then you open the gate and they're like, super friendly, so they have a term for this. 
They call it barrier anxiety. So dogs get barrier anxiety. So a barrier introduces anxiety because they cannot confront the interaction in any way that they want. They have constraints in that interaction. And that makes them incredibly uncomfortable and so they become aggressive, right? When you take the barrier away, all of a sudden the aggression disappears. I think a lot of us have the same thing. We have barrier anxiety. So where our comfort zone ends, Anything beyond that comfort zone introduces anxiety into our lives, isn't it so? Seasons have a barrier. They have a boundary. And when we try to cross the boundary, exit the old into the new, that automatically introduces anxiety. And so some of you might be sitting here today about this new year, and yes, you might be excited, you might be petrified, but all of us are sitting with anxiety because we are entering the unknown. We don't know what next year holds for us. We have some ideas. We might be right, we might be wrong. We might be on some degree of right and wrong in the spectrum. <laughs> but the fact that we cannot with certainty say is what introduces that anxiety because we have this imaginary boundary that we're crossing tonight at 12. What's interesting to me about this video, about this little girl, is I see three things that are incredibly powerful for us to consider when we think about how we approach exiting seasons and entering seasons. The first is there is relational certainty in that interaction. Let me tell you why I say that. The relational security that she has is in her mom's voice. You guys saw the mom was talking, but it's not just the mom. She obviously trusts her mom. She's got history with her mom. She knows her mom won't do her harm. But you can also see that because she's wearing a life jacket. Did you guys notice that? Where do you think the life jacket came from? The mom, right? So the mom has built trust with this little girl. So she has got relational security. So in the relationship, she can trust her mother. Does that make sense what I'm saying? That would be a very different video if there was no trust between the girl and the mom. Do you guys agree? So there's something here that's incredibly valuable to say for us to accurately and with hope and with with a healthy posture, engage a new season, we need some form of relational security. Isn't that so? The second dimension that's interesting to me is that what happened in that video that really kind of changed her perspective to get her to, get her to do the thing. What needed to happen before she took the jump? Her brother jumped. Isn't that fascinating? Because up until the point where her brother jumped, there was no practical security because I haven't seen anybody else do this. So although my mom is cheering me on and I can trust my mom, my mom didn't jump. She didn't show me that this was possible. She told me she did not show me. The brother steps into that space and he says, I will show you practically that this is okay, this is safe, this is fine. But then there's this third dimension and it's almost an emotional security. And my view is that I think our biggest challenge when we are confronted with boundaries does not sit in the practical space and it does not sit in the relational space. It sits in our emotional space. Because even though she saw her brother, even though her mother is willing her on, she's confronted with this fear and she's constantly saying, wait, 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 I've got this. Why does she have to say, I've got this? Who is she talking to? She's talking to herself. Because she's got fear and anxiety in her mind that's trying to keep her back from this boundary. And so she says, yes, I've got relational security. I've got practical security. But I still have, despite the fact that it's irrational, I still have fears. I still have concerns. I still have anxiety. I still have discomfort. And so I need to now speak to these voices. I've got this. Isn't that incredible? And all of us go through exactly the same process. Whenever we try to cross a boundary, we need those three ingredients. We need relational security, we need practical security, and we need emotional security. And I think sometimes we get thrust into, we get thrust out of comfort zones into new seasons without having put those things in place. And that amplifies the anxiety that we feel, and that automatically changes the posture with which we engage the new season. Are you guys with me? Okay, so in our own leaps, what gives us the hope to surrender to the process? Have you guys been bungee jumping before, anybody? 
that moment when you step off the ledge is the most terrifying. Am I right? So I, I went bungee jumping once. And you know, everybody's like, yes, yes, I'm going to do this jump. And you're going to do the backflips. And you're going to do all of that stuff. And you know what happened when I stepped off the ledge? As soon as I stepped off the ledge, because you're looking in front of you, they tell you uh, where I jumped, there was a bridge in front of us. So they say, look at the bridge. Don't look down. <laughs> okay? So you have to kind of hop to the boundary. And then they say, look at the bridge. And you're like, and they count really fast because they know people back out. So they're like, five, four, three, two, one, jump. And when, when you bend your knees to jump, you look down. You know what happened? I dropped like a rock. <laughs> like my legs went numb. And when I fell, you know what happened? Because you're like, freedom, or whatever it is you're going to shout. You know what happened? <laughs> That's what happened, <laughs> right? You can attest. You, it knocks the breath out of you. Why? Is there relational security in that situation when you go bungee jumping? Is there relational security? There is. And I'll tell you why I say that. Do you trust the people where you go bungee? Yes. Why do you trust them? Because there's some form of governance and oversight, you hope. They've got a certificate on a wall somewhere. And as soon as you get there, they start talking to you. And they explain the process. So that builds trust. It builds relational security to say, hey, these guys know what they're doing. Especially when they tell you that entire bungee cord is made from underwear elastic. Because it is, right? That builds a lot of trust. So <laughs> it actually does because you have to snap more than half of individual bands. So it's much more safe than just one band. So the point is there is a relational security because you have built trust with these people. Whether it's the brand of the organization or whether it's the person you're jumping with or whether it's the fact that there's governance, there's trust that these guys are doing a good job. It's not going to kill you. Do you have practical security? Yes, because you've seen a million people do this before. In fact, you've probably just seen somebody do it and they were fine. So you've seen that this is possible. This can be done. So why the anxiety? And this leads me back to my point. When we are confronted with stepping across a boundary, our biggest challenge is not relational security. Our biggest challenge is not practical security. Our biggest challenge is in our own internal emotional security. Because our narrative, our fear, our discomfort with stepping out of our comfort zone is the primary obstacle that we face. And we have to have that internal voice to say, you've got this. Isn't that incredible? And so much of what frames our reality is framed actually then by the way that we respond to our own fear. All the challenges, all the pain, all the discomfort, all the anxiety that we experience when we step across a boundary, when we go into a new season, is fear that we create in our own minds. Isn't that crazy? So the question is, can we do something about it? Jesus shows us a better way. So I want you to page to your Bibles, Hebrews 6, verse 19. Now, Hebrews is a little bit of a, a theologically heavy book, for those of you who haven't read it. It was written specifically to the Hebrew community to explain the implications of Christ on the design that God had for the temple and the high priests, to say that Jesus has come to fulfill everything that you saw in the tabernacle and all the um, temples that followed because they were foreshadowings of Christ. And so this whole book explains why the Jewish discussion was a setup for what Christ was going to come do, right? And so in chapter 6, he starts in, in an interesting way. He starts with verse 1. Listen to this verse. It's not on the screen, sorry. Therefore, let us go on and get past the elementary stage in the teachings and doctrines of Christ. Let us get past the elementary stage on the teachings and the doctrines of Christ, advancing steadily towards the completeness and perfection that belong to spiritual maturity. Just think about that verse for a second. He's saying, guys, we need to go to the meat because if we want to become spiritually mature, we have to leave the elementary teachings behind. 
And what he's talking about here is salvation. So further in the chapter, he says, because we know Jesus came to save us and we have salvation and we have all of those things. That's not the discussion here. There's something much more significant. There is the source of hope. And so if you read further in that chapter, verse 18, I'm going to start from verse 18. This was so that by two unchangeable things, and the Amplified explains it at his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us. Do we have relational security? Let me read that again. Which in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us. If that's true, do we have relational security? Yes. If you don't believe me, then you have to ask yourself, what relational security do we have when God who designed us, created us, loved us, gave us His only Son, so that we may have life and life in abundance. Does that not give us relational security? He was willing to pay the highest price so that we could have abundance and fullness of life. So relational security we have. It's a foregone conclusion. Who have fled to him for refuge might have mightily indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp, listen to this, to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. And then verse 19, now we have this hope as the sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. It cannot slip, it cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it. A hope that reaches further and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil, where Jesus has entered in for us in advance, a forerunner having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus brings a hope. So, do we have relational security? Yes, because we know God's intent. Do we have practical security? Who is the example? The brother did the thing. Right? Jesus jumped. He showed us. It can be done. It's possible. This is within the realm of possibility now. You can do it and not get injured or get damaged. He says, you will do greater works than these. So everything that Jesus does, and this is why it was so important that he be fully God and fully man. Because everything that Jesus does now becomes a practical example for me and you. And we can do all those things and more, according to him. So the first two criteria have been met. So what's the challenge? The challenge is our emotional security. And this is where hope enters the picture. So let me explain what we've read here. If you read on in chapter 7, 8, and 9, it kind of creates context for this. And I don't want to go into kind of the technical detail, but here's the point. Before Jesus came, who were the priests that had to intercede for the sins of the people? It was the Levites, the Levitical priesthood, right? The challenge with the Levites is every time you have a new high priest, similar to every time you have a new president or a new manager or a new person in authority over you, do the rules of the game change slightly? Because a new leader always introduces change, isn't it so? And so even though you have a Levitical priesthood, every time you have a transition of a priest, something in the fabric changes. And so it is not consistent, it is not secure, it is not predictable. Are you with me? Here comes Jesus, not of the tribe of the Levites, because he's from the tribe of Judah, which has no priestly calling, and therefore he is not from the appointment of the Levites, he is from the appointment of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was not a Jew, he was the guy who spoke to Abraham, right? And he was a person, the king of Salem, who never did die. It is an everlasting priesthood. Why this is important is it means that the priesthood, the high priest, will never change. He will forever be Jesus, and he will forever introduce consistency into the framework in which we find existence. Does that make sense? Do you understand the source of the hope? Because Jesus, who was sent by his Father to say, these 
Every single individual is so valuable that I want you to go pay the price on their behalf so that they never have to. You will show them what is possible. You will show them my original intent, my blueprint for their design. And once you've done that, you will intercede in heavenly places as their high priest for all eternity. Come on, guys. If this is true, if this is true, what fear has a place when I transition into a new season? Because I know that in this new season, there is a God that has plans to prosper me and not to harm me. He has showed me that intent. He has given me the example to show me that it's possible. And he says, irrespective of what happens and irrespective of the fact that you do not know what to expect, the high priest is already interceding on your behalf. So why fear the unknown? Because the unknown is secured in the hands of the Father. Isn't that incredible? So the question is, what changes in the way that we approach a new season when we recognize that God has good plans for me? And although I do not understand this new season and I cannot anticipate it and I cannot predict it and I cannot control it, it will be to my benefit. Then the only thing that remains is for us to say, is it possible for me as an individual to get comfortable with the fact that I have the capacity to, in whatever happens, have a positive emotional response. Because my fear, my anxiety, is created by the fact that I do not know if I am able to respond to whatever is going to happen to me in the new season. And it is that inability to understand whether I will have control that is creating the pressure. But I don't have to control it. I have to cast my burdens unto Jesus. And so have I been given a mechanism with which to engage every single space and every single environment in a sustainable way to say, take every thought captive. Because the battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the principalities and the dark forces. I get to choose the role that fear plays in my life because God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. Is fear an unhealthy thing? No, it's not. Did God give us fear? Is emotions from God? Did he design us with the ability to have and experience fear? Yes. Why? Why did God give us emotions if they are so bad? See, the challenge is that we misappropriate emotion. Emotion's job is incredibly important. But emotion is not a good boss. It's like a dashboard in a car. It tells you when something is wrong, but it doesn't tell you how to fix it. You with me? Should you look at the lights blinking on the dashboard of your life? Of course, they tell you something. But they are only an indicator of something. What is fear an indicator of? It brings everything that you are into that moment. Isn't it so? When you are petrified... All of your attention, all of your energy is focused into that thing. Isn't it so? What your body tells you, the way that you were designed to deal with fear is to say, you have to pay attention. You cannot engage the space on autopilot. Does that make sense? So all that fear does is it says, hey, snap out of it. Pay attention. But then the fear doesn't have to define the action. The fear is only there to bring presence into the space. If I understand that, then I don't have to be afraid of fear. I have to harness fear. Does that make sense? You know that nobody, there's nobody in the world that's not afraid of heights. You have an automatic response to heights because you need to pay attention. If you make a mistake, it is going to kill you. That's why your body does that. Some people just continue moving despite the fact that they're afraid of heights. Are you with me? Okay. So... Why is it so important when we cross a boundary into a new season that we must experience fear? Because everything in my comfort zone is comfortable. I know it. I can anticipate it. I can predict it. And because of that, I do not have to employ all my faculties in my current environment because it is not required. 
Does that make sense? As soon as I cross a boundary, I have so many unknowns. I have new risks. I have new things that I cannot anticipate. And so I must be present. Does that make sense? Fear is just supposed to do that for me. It's supposed to say, hey, pay attention. You are entering a new space. You cannot function half-focused. You have to come into this thing with intention, and all of a sudden, the posture changes. To say, hey, all that fear is doing is it's saying, focus on what you're doing. I had a discussion a long time ago with somebody that spoke about kind of self-fulfilling prophecy, especially in the way that you raise your kids. So the words that you use, right? Don't do that. Be careful, or what? Jy gaan fall. So like they're doing something stupid, and you're like, you're going to fall. But when you say that, you put their focus on falling, right? So it does become a self-fulfilling prophecy because pink elephant. It's the same principle, right? So I've changed the way that I communicate with my kids. And I say, focus. I say, pay attention. Because I want them to pay attention. I don't want them to fall. I don't want them to focus on the falling. I want them to focus on what they're doing. Because they have control. Isn't it so? And so the opportunity that we have is to say, well, now that we know that we have relational security and we have uh, practical security and we have emotional security, all I have to recognize is that there is hope in the new season and the fear is just there to bring me into the present. I have everything I need to navigate the space, but it's not going to work if I do it like I did it in the desert. I cannot enter the promised land the way that I functioned in the desert. So I'm crossing a boundary. I'm going through the Jordan. I have to get my feet wet. I have to sanctify because I have to recognize that there is a boundary that is being crossed and the rules of engagement are different on the other side of the boundary. If I do not act on that intentionally, I'm going to walk into my new season and I'm still going to behave like I did in the season before. So fear is a wonderful thing. you might be approaching the new year in one of three ways. The first is that you feel you're in a box, you're stuck, and you, that box might be your comfort zone. It might be chosen. You might want that box. What does hope look like in that context for you? If this is you, then I want to encourage you to peer out of the box and see that there is light on the other side. There is something outside of the space in which you're allowing yourself to function. I chose that word. Allowing yourself to function. You choose that. But when you see what's on the outside and you see that that is hopeful because Jesus is calling you out, that's what you should focus on because you will outgrow the box automatically. And if you feel like that box is a constraint, it's not self-chosen, but it's being imposed on you, focus on the hope that Jesus has for you. He's already shown you the way. And when you focus on that hope, the transition will happen in due course. Perhaps you have been going through a deep, dark night. Perhaps 2023 was a really tough year for you. But joy comes in the morning. And we know that every evening is followed by a morning. And that is the hope. The sunrise is the hope. And so all you have to do is recognize that this new season is just a change of cycle. And the sun is beginning to rise and it says, focus on the sun. Focus on the hope. It might just be a glimmer right now, but it's coming. Perhaps you are walking through the deep, dark, sunless valley of death. But you do not have to fear evil because you will prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And so all you need is his word as a light unto your path and a lamp unto your feet. Because even though you do not feel like you can see everything going on around you, it's almost like you've lost vision, you've lost focus, you've lost perspective. God is saying, focus on the next step and trust me. This is exactly what the Israelites went through in the desert, right? They didn't move unless the cloud moved. They didn't move unless the pillar of fire moved. And so if you're in a season where you feel like you cannot move unencumbered, you can only see one step ahead, 
if you have relational security and emotional security and practical security, is one step ahead not enough? And so I don't know which one of these are appropriate in your life, but it doesn't really matter because in every single perspective that you could approach this new year with, there is hope. And that hope is that there is Jesus, your high priest, that will never change, that is constantly interceding on your behalf. So I want to encourage you to take every thought captive and the anxiety and the fear that you might feel about next year. And perhaps you have anticipation and hope. That's wonderful. But whatever it is that you're processing through, I want you to acknowledge the fear that you have and say, but what is this fear asking me to focus on? Because the fear is not the person that dictates my behavior. You get to choose that. But harness the fear because it gives you an idea, it gives you an inkling, it gives you a direction with which to focus. And so I want, as we close, to take three minutes, turn to the person next to you, and pray into that one space together where you feel like this is the hope that I have, or this is the anxiety that I have, or this is the fear that I'm experiencing. Pray together into that space so that you can go into next year with a posture that you've chosen. Amen.